On this episode of The Love Life, we're talking about a meeting planner's 21-step guide to audiovisual awesomeness and more on The Love Life. The network for the AV industry. What are you listening to? This. This is AV. This. This. This is is AV Nation. Nation. This is AV Nation. Support for AV Nation is brought to you by Kramer. AV Beyond the Box. This is The Love Life, episode 28, Meeting Planner 21-Step Guide to AV Awesomeness. Welcome to The Live Life. I'm your host, Wallace Johnson, where you can find me on Twitter, at WallaceCTS. And so we're going to be bringing you some influential people and topics related to the selling, planning, designing, producing, delivering live event productions. Uh, So today's episode is going to be the Meeting Planner's Guide. Uh, 21 Steps to Audiovisual Awesomeness. And so joining me today to discuss this topic is uh, John Laposa, Senior Director of PSAV uh, and MVP International and PSAV Select Hotels, and Rick Bloom, CEO of Intentional AV. Welcome, gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you. Cool. Well, Rick, I'll start with you. How did you get into the AV industry? Well, uh, my life path has just sort of been one continuum uh, all the way through. Uh, when I was a kid in elementary school, I played music, and it started out with a, with a, with a musical bass. Uh, I got into producing college concerts when I was uh, on campus at UC Santa Barbara, and that led me into a 25-year career uh, in the music business in Los Angeles, booking major name rock and roll tours. And um, during a, a life change somewhere in the uh, mid to late 90s, um, I was a very good friend of mine who had known me for years and years before has pointed me towards a gentleman who was in the AV industry in San Francisco, uh, who ultimately became my mentor. And we found out that I had so many similarities from my music and production background that fit so well with AV that it was just sort of a natural fit. And I guess the the point of that story is that I never went to work for him at his company, but he led me along the right path to get into mine. So that's, uh, that's how I got in. Very cool. And John, how about you? Well, I started out um, going to school for multi-track audio recording in in New York city and uh, worked for, um, um, number of years in a recording studio, um, had the opportunity to join a cruise line and go work out on cruise ships and had never been on a cruise ship before and packed up everything, called mom and said, I'm, I'm leaving out of town. And the following afternoon, I was in Miami boarding a cruise ship and I ended up spending a good six years or so there, learned a lot there, did some, some li- learned live audio as opposed to uh, studio audio and a lot about uh, stage lighting. Um, spent about six years working at cruise lines and, and then set, finally settled in Orlando, uh, where I did a lot of freelance work for a number of years, um, worked for Disney. And one of the most interesting jobs I ever had was being a laser operator at the Epcot, um, laser show at the lagoon show there. Um, that was a lot of fun, but, uh, one of the places that I worked at was the Orlando world center, Marriott Orlando world center. Mm-hmm. And, um, that led me to a, a full-time, uh, job and career with Marriott, which in turn led me to. Uh, the MVP program. So that's, that's that the, is a pretty cool story. Yeah. So gentlemen, both of you have been in this industry for quite some time. What is it that has kept you here that you love about this industry? I'll take that one. All right. um, uh, I love the completion factor. I love the fact that we do projects and that at the end of the day, uh, it's complete with a client and what we do and what we provide for them. Uh, I love the planning of the details. Uh, I'm a real detail freak. And what I find is that in the pre-planning process, which actually kind of leads into our our document that we helped create, um, I enjoy sharing that vision and sharing that uh, checklist, if you will, um, with the client so that once we arrive uh, at our event, it's almost just handling the details and almost managing what we've what we've done all in the, in the completion process so um i really love the completion and, and getting there and john how about you uh, you know i like the fact that it's always something different you're you're always you you're you're working in different places in different venues you're working with different people you're working on different projects you're traveling to different areas um you know the 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 
the gig on the cruise ships was really the first extensive traveling that I'd ever done. And I haven't stopped since that was some 30 years ago or so. And, and, and I'm still traveling and I, and I enjoy it. I love seeing new places and, and going to going to new places and meeting new people. And so I like the fact that it's always different. It's always something different. Both of you have a uh, pretty different backgrounds from how you've come up through the industry, you know, why you love the industry. Looking back, what's something you would tell your younger self to give them advice or somebody new coming into the industry that you would give advice uh, to, to help them excel um, at an earlier standpoint? Uh, I, th- I think um, one of the things that I wish I had done more of as a, as a, as a younger person in the industry was talk to more people and get to know more people. Um, when you're working on a show, you're working on a project, you're at a show site, regardless of what you're doing, you might be a stagehand, you might be the, the, the lighting director, whoever it is, regardless of what you're doing, there are so many people that are there in that room with you that know so many things. Um, get to know them. Talk to them when, when, you know, when the time is appropriate, ask them about their work, ask them, ask them some of the same questions that you're asking us and, and learn from them because they, they, there's a wealth of knowledge in that room, whether it's a hotel ballroom or an arena, there's a, there are so many people that know so many things and have so many experiences that you can, that you can learn from and get to know. Um, and, and, um, and they they love to share those of us in the industry. We all love to share what we know with other people, especially when we find a younger person who's as, as excited about it as we are. Um, that's one of the, the, the greatest returns that I think personally that, that we all feel is that we love to share our knowledge with somebody who's, who's in, in who is just as excited and enthusiastic about it as we are. <clears throat> yeah. yeah, John, I'm going to uh, comment and, and, and take off on what you just uh, shared a little bit because uh, I, I think it's all in relationships as well. And, and while you were just speaking, I was thinking about those young people, uh, younger people than, than us, uh, after a session or while we're in setup or somewhere in there, sharing war stories, sharing, asking openly, you know, where have you been? What are your goals? Uh, you know, helping helping them along the way and helping realize how much value we bring to the table as well. Um, you know, one of the th- one of the things that I really uh, like to like to lean on these days, now that I've been in it for a few years, is how important it is to get yourself out of your own way. Uh, you know, we can get so hung up in either the company we work for or the clients that we're trying to serve is that we take ourselves out of our own way and just take a step back and feel and realize that we're serving uh, an end goal and an end purpose and that it's not about the money anymore. It's about the relationship that, that you create, which only magnifies itself once you go down the road with a client for X number of years, or even if it's a one-off, uh, just knowing that you did your best at the end of the day uh, really goes to create uh, you know, that, that whole feeling of giving back and, uh, and giving to the greater good at the end of the day. That's, that's what I think. Yeah, I, I think that's a, that's a great point you make, Rick. And I, I would say, I would sum it up by saying, remember to have fun with it. Remember, stop once in a while and, and, and remember why you got into the business that you're in now in the first place. Um, because it was fun, because it was interesting, whether you're a, whether you're a techie or a planner or whatever, whatever role you play in the business, whether your thing is audio or lighting or whatever, it, you got into it because you loved it. So stop and remind yourself once in a while what you, what you love about it and, 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 and remember to enjoy it because um, you're right. If it's only about the money, then it's going to get old pretty fast, regardless of what the money is. If you're not enjoying what you're doing, then you're, you're really missing something. Now, that's some amazing feedback and lessons for the uh, future generations of the industry. So thank you for sharing, gentlemen. So to get into our main topic, we're talking about the uh, Meeting Planner's 21-Step Guide for Audiovisual Awesomeness, which was developed by Infocom's Live Event Council, which I so happen to be chair of. And uh, you two gentlemen are very active members of the council. Um, So, Rick, I'll start with you. Why was this important to get this guide put together? Well, let me let me set this back in some context for everybody. Um, I was I've I've been on the council for a long time, and uh, we actually came out with the first version of this thing back in 2012, uh, and it was called 25 Steps, uh, or 25 Things Every Meeting Planner Should Know, uh, and it's still as a matter of fact, it's the, the the free download, the free white paper that I have on my website today. Uh, which reminds me that I have to upload it and uh, and put the new one on there in its place. But the thinking at the time was that there were um, 
it, it was very similar to how we, what we put into to putting this one together. And that is to be a bridge between, you know, we get into our whole, our, our culture uh, in the AV industry as professionals, we have our own language, we have our own customs. And, uh, you know, if a, if a meeting planner doesn't know what we're doing, and conversely, if we don't, if we, planners don't know what we're doing and we don't know what they're doing, it becomes a mire of uh, you know, people not knowing, not knowing what's going on. And in that whole thing about, you know, knowledge is power, um, we decided to develop this thing and at least give the introduction and the introductory bridge to, um, to be able to, to open up some topics and open up some thinking and open up the conversation and the collaboration between uh, between meeting professionals whose job it is to uh, to put meetings on with you know food and beverage and hotel rooms and all sorts of things that we don't deal with and for them to know what we're up to as well so that's how it kind of began uh, and this document is uh, you know feeds that that next step and we feel that felt that it had to grow um, and really come into I mean five years is a huge gap in our industry as we know even six months uh, can be a big gap um, but we, we, we put that thinking in and we had this bedrock to work on. And uh, I think we made some significant improvements and, uh, and, and opened the conversation up even wider with what we, what we produced here. There's a lot of information to be shared here. So I'm going to start with, uh, with John and asking both of you, you know, with, with everything that's been shared of the 21 steps, what are the three most valuable tips uh, from this guide that you think planners should pay most attention to in their process of planning a memorable event? Yeah, you know, there, there's, there's a lot of technical information in here. There are tips about audio, there are tips about lighting, there are tips about new technology. But I, I think in general, the things that are most, that I think should be most valuable are the tips that focus on the pre-planning and the conversations and starting that conversation about technology early. Um, as a meeting planner, if you're not taking into account the technology that you're going to be using early on in the planning process, even before you've selected a venue, in fact, one of the tips is selecting the right venue, um, then you're, you're really setting yourself up for some challenges on down the road. So tip number one, for example, is sharing your meeting goals with your technology partner. Find a technology partner early. If you've worked with someone on a, on a previous event um, and you've got a working relationship with them, it's, it's good to have a technology partner that you know and can trust. And, and, and then once you, once you have that relationship, then you can even include them on some of your site visits and, and get their input from, from their perspective um, as you're selecting the venue. Um, tip number three talks about um, technology proposals and requests for proposals. And then number four that addresses, as I said, selecting the right venue. Those are all steps in the pre-planning process. Um, and I think those are, are probably the most important ones. The other ones on technology are very important. They come afterwards. If you, if, if you don't have this pre-planning and conversation process as a foundation, then the, the tips that are more specific about the technology um, probably aren't going to be very helpful to you. Uh, I would also say, as I was just thumbing through the guide again uh, uh, most recently uh, earlier today, um, don't skip over and don't gloss over the introduction and the conclusion um, because there's some good information in there and, and a theme that you'll find um, repeated specifically in the introduction and conclusion is to get that conversation started early and to, and to work the technology um, aspect of your meeting into the overall planning process. You want to do that for your budget. You want to do that for your space allocations. You want to do that for, for labor. You want to do that for, all, for a number of, of, of reasons. You want to make sure that you include the technology and get that conversation started early. So I think um, those are probably the most important and most valuable ones for me. <clears throat> Great tips. And Rick, how about you? Well, uh, you know, I think that really what we've, uh, again, what we've done here is we've really helped to set the stage uh, for the conversation. And I think that's really the most important uh, takeaway of all uh, out of all of this, that um, find a technology partner early. Yeah, you may have a list of a lot of people in your market or in the city that you're going to or experiences with people that you've worked with over a number of years. But finding somebody that you can, uh, as a planner, that you can sh who will, sh that you will share your vision and 
ask you the right questions, almost on the soft skill side rather than on the technology side, finding somebody that thinks like you think and, and at least has some flexibility in that, uh, in that arena uh, is probably one of the most very uh, most valuable things. And start early in the process. Uh, nothing, nothing gets thought of with, without any air to breathe, without any time to think about, um, about the technology that you're going to apply or the relationship that you're going to end up with. Digging really down into the trenches with people uh, who are going to be your technology partners if you don't have a chance to think about it. That's, that's probably number one. Uh, number two is, you know, we took, again, John said we talk about, a lot about uh, you know, specific technologies in here. Uh, but I, I also want to caution people to not just go after new technologies, even though you may research them really well, just because they're the new shiny object on the block, just because it's the new thing. Uh, it may not apply to your event. It may be money worse, the, the worst money that you spend uh, as a planner on trying something new that may not fit the, the end goals uh, for your event or for your meeting. So uh, you know, there's no reason to, you know, to misspend money when budgets are still really tight in this day and age. And the third thing is, uh, I think this is most important, is I was reading, rereading the whole guide again, um, was that we make this distinction. There's one chapter in here about um, uh, in-house versus outside vendor considerations. And I don't think that meeting planners uh, and meeting professionals really spend enough time doing that. They almost default to the easy way, which is to use whoever's in-house. Whether it's a cost increment or not, they just relax in that, uh, at that comfort space uh, of just using whoever's there on property. But I think if you think outside the box, if, you, if, if planners really look at their contracts and really make an effort to control as much as they can, they'll probably end up with um, – uh, an option of a mix of in-house and outside or an outside person and just, you know, be willing to take that risk and play in that space a little bit uh, for the better outcome of your meeting at the end of the day. You know, Wallace, I, 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 Wallace, I think there's a, there's a lot of pressure these days on meeting planners to, um, to create more of an experience as opposed to just plan a meeting. And technology is, is one of the greatest ways to do that. But as Rick said, not all technology is the appropriate technology. So you, you want to have somebody that you know and trust and hopefully have worked with in, in the past um, that you can put these questions to and that you can trust to come up with suggestions um, that, that, you, that you can consider. And, 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 and sometimes technology is a, a, a specific technology is perfect for a particular event. And sometimes it has no place in a particular event, but it might be perfect for the next event. So just because it's available doesn't mean that we have to use it, but the trick is to get all of the creative juices flowing and, and work together to come up with something that your attendees walk away from really having been enriched by the experience of, of, of the entire event rather than just having attended another run-of-the-mill meeting. No, totally agree, totally agree. And I made some notes on, you know, what would my top three points be in, in comparison to you guys? And it's obvious, you know, the number one thing in terms of number one and sharing your meeting goals and starting that process early to really help the partner you want to work with, or if you're in a bidding process, the partners you're looking at um, to, to understand what those goals are. Um, so I had that one in common and, and Rick, I, I kind of went your direction a little bit. Um, from my notes on just the planning aspect of what the guide provided um, with that one being my uh, one of mine. Um, another one was uh, number 14, don't take internet connectivity for granted. And the only reason I went to that one, just because if you want to ruin a conference real quick, have bad internet, <laughs> regardless of how great the AV was, if the internet's bad, the food tasted horrible, the room didn't sleep well, like there's just so much wrong if you don't have internet. But yeah, couldn't, couldn't get connected. Yeah, right. Couldn't get connected. Then your, your day was done. <laughs> That's right. The, the conference just was bad. <laughs> um, and the last piece that I wrote um, was the uh, last point of the follow through. Um, and that's really just keeping the, the uh, end goal in mind from starting early, sharing your goals, and then really looking at, you know, how, what was achieved? Did, did, did you reach those goals? Was there shortfalls in the process? You know, after you get your internet and this technology in the room and, you know, looking back, what was that experience that you wanted and did you achieve it? Um, 
But yeah, I think the key to all of it really, um, as you said in the beginning, is looking at the beginning of the document with, with the uh, and the conclusion of the document because the, the the message is really start early to to really get the ideas and the pressure off to to expand your mindset on really taking advantage of the uh, of what could be potential uh, in the meeting. Yeah, Wallace, if I could um, just um, double back on that for a moment. You asked Rick. Um, why was it important to put this guide together? And I think that's one of the, the most important reasons is the, our, part of our role in, in, in Infocom and the Live Events Council is to, is to help educate the meeting planner world on, on what we do and make them more comfortable with it. And hopefully, as they become more comfortable with it, they will be more uh, apt to have that conversation to start it early. Um, one of the things that I've seen over and over again, and I'm sure Rick has too, and certainly anybody who's worked in a hotel environment, um, is folks who shy away from the conversation about technology just because they're not comfortable with it. Um, you know, they know all about all the other aspects of planning a meeting, but when it comes to the technology, they don't, they don't feel comfortable with it. So they shy away from the conversation and it ends up getting postponed and put off and, and ignored and everything else and, until it's so late in the planning process that we end up backing ourselves into corners when it comes to um, technology and budgets for technology and everything else. So uh, by by, um, you know, using a guide like this to, to increase the comfort level, if you will, of a, of a meeting planner, hopefully that will encourage that meeting planner to, to, to start those conversations earlier. Absolutely. Um, gentlemen, both of you, again, you have different backgrounds, Rick as a producer, John as someone who oversees uh, on-site managers working directly with clients on a, on a daily basis. How do you implement this guide in your current business environment? And uh, John, I'll start with you. Well, one of the things that we do in providing um, over property support for the folks at the properties who provide the actual technical experience um, is we provide training. Um, the majority of the training that we provide is technical in nature, designed for the technicians, but we also provide training that's specifically designed for sales managers and event managers, primarily at hotel properties. Um, so a lot of the information that we try to impart to them in those, those sales classes and those event management classes is, is very similar, um, to what's in the guide here. And, and again, one of the recurring themes as as we've been hearing, um, so far is, is start the conversation early and, and find somebody that you know and trust early. So uh, a lot of what's in the guide is, is what we provide to these, um, sales and event managers at the properties. And again, for exactly the same reason, because this is where we find where, you know, a lot of folks, you've got an event manager who's, who's very comfortable with planning the meals and things, but when it comes to the technology, they're not so comfortable. So they kind of shy away from the conversation. And if they also happen to be working with a meeting planner, who's equally uncomfortable with the technology, then you've got two folks who are avoiding the subject of technology and nobody <laughs> wants to talk about it. Until it's too right. So uh, there's, there's a lot of parallels there. <laughs> Very true. Uh, I, yeah, I, I come at it from a different perspective because, uh, you know, obviously my, my closest relationship is being an adjunct, uh, being the outsource AV guy, uh, so to speak, uh, to a meeting planner, whether they're inside a company or an association or whether they're a third party. And uh, Wallace, uh, you shared with us when we were preparing for this that uh, you had uh, distributed this uh, or made it available at MPIWEC uh, a couple of months ago, and uh, which I think is great to be able to take this information and just put it in people's hands, which I think is the greatest thing that we can possibly do, uh, is to educate at every step of the way. John, you do it internally with all of your guys uh, and all your people on both sides. I share it on my website. I share it directly with the meeting professional community, uh, and I think that's a great space to be able to do that. Like I said, I'll be uploading this uh, probably this afternoon uh, to my own website, and uh, it'll be available there for everybody uh, so we can all learn and grow and start the conversation and keep the conversation going. So. And gentlemen, you talked about this a little bit earlier, but if you could elaborate, you know, what's the benefit of working with a planner who's, you know, experienced or familiar with this information and is comfortable um, you know, talking with their technology partner, you know, what, what does that allow for when you get that cohesive environment to, uh, to make things happen? Uh, it, it just makes life so much easier for everybody. <laughs> if if I, I think Rick mentioned earlier, if we, if we, if we all understand what the other person is doing, then it, it just, it, 
it simplifies the process, it streamlines the process, it makes the process more pleasant. Um, you, you can talk on an, on an even level and, and not have to stop so often to try to explain things to each other. Um, so the more the meeting planner understands about technology, the, the easier job the, 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 the producer and the, and the technology specialists are going to have. And I would also add that it works the other way around as well. Um, if you've got a, a technology expert who understands something about the meeting planning process and understands what that meeting planner is thinking about as you're, as you're sitting across the table, you know, throwing out all these great technology ideas and the meeting planner is, is sitting there thinking about all of the other things that go into planning the meeting and, and trying to, trying to work it into the budget and everything else. The more we understand the other person's job, the, the easier the whole process is for everyone and the, and the better, and the better product we end up with. Yeah, I think I think it cuts the meet the the, the explanation time at least in half, if not more, uh, to be able to come into some people who have really done their homework, um, you know, on on the meeting planner side. And what it also does, and John was alluding to it right there, is that it allows for more of the creative process to take place, and you know, kind of get out of the out of the uh, the structural part of it and get into the fun side, uh, yeah. which is really like, to, like just exactly like John said, like creating a better product at the end of the day for uh, the planner or their client and whoever else is involved. Yep. So I'm hearing the key takeaway. The more time you allow to plan your meeting, the more value you can get from your meeting. Absolutely. Well, yeah. I, and I think I would, I would put it that the, the time you spend planning comes back to you exponentially. Yes. Um, a little bit of time spent planning ahead of time is going to save you multiples of, of that time later on down the road and help you avoid service failures and challenges and, you know, things that uh, there's always going to be something that pops up. Um, but the, the more planning that you do, the, the, the more you can minimize the opportunity for, for things to go wrong. Fantastic. So several years ago, Infocom uh, rolled out, you know, what, what they define as the exceptional experience. Um, and then this year we had the Tide Conference. And I think in both of these, it, it was really sending a message where it's not about, you know, strictly the technology, but it's more, you know, it's the space in which you're having a meeting, the content in which you're developing for a meeting. Um, what would be a great follow-up tool that can be, you know, developed whether by the council or somebody else listening to this podcast that's out there and says, you know, this guy is great. You know, but, you know, here's some other details that come along with the experience of a, of a great meeting. So what's another uh, tool that planners could, you know, potentially hope to get from, you know, an AV provider or the council to, to complement this, uh, this guy that's been developed? Go ahead, Rick. Johnny, go ahead. <laughs> I, I got one and I have to prep everybody that I have, I have not discussed this with either of these two guys. I came up with it last night as I was preparing for all of this. And uh, I don't know where this is going to go in the universe, but just throw it out there and see what happens. Uh, as I was thinking about this, as you know what? We're talking about information and we're talking about ask, access to information immediately and what happens to somebody two, three in the morning, they get an idea uh, that they want to investigate. What if Infocom or someone, a third party, would come up with an app that would be specially designed to have all the tools, a an AV glossary, a link to the Infocom glossary, the real deep one um, that explains everything that, um, that technology is about or that we've you know put into definition for them that there would be an avrfp link in there that we could put in there that would also help a, a planner organize their thoughts organize what it is that they need really work through the process at any time of the day or night 24 7 and all have it be a walking reference guide that they could take around on their phone because everybody has one there isn't anybody without one and maybe even maybe um, get to be able to send out a daily kind of quiz, fun quiz question in that app for every planner to be able to quiz their knowledge and keep them fresh and keep them moving towards their AV technology providers and their technology partners uh, to ask those questions and to create the interaction going on uh, moment to moment rather than just being in a static 16 page guide. A daily did you know? Exactly. That could be pretty cool. Yeah. 
I thought so. So, John, John what's your thoughts? Um, you know, the, 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 the recent Infocom conference that, that, that we were all just um, attendees at, and we sat in on several panels and several discussions, and the, the theme that I kept hearing over and over again was about the experience, and different people use different words, uh, you know, wow factor, telling the story, and so forth. What they were really getting at is the idea that we're, we're moving into a, a period of time where, for the most part, the technology is, is really a commodity. Um, and it's not about the technology. It's not about, we, we've all seen enough of the technology now that we're not really impressed by the new technology. So the question is, how do we use that technology to create, again, more of an experience and, right. and, and to create an event that is experiential, that, that leaves the attendees, you know, walking away from it, really feeling like they've been enriched by it. So from Infocom's perspective, I think anything that we can do not only for meeting planners, but, but for, for primarily young technicians and, and younger folks who are coming up in the business, um, to teach them to, to consider an event as an, as an overall experience as opposed to just focusing on one narrow thing. You know, you might be the A1 on the show, but it's not just about the audio. You might be the head electrician on the show, but it's not just about the lighting. You know, it's the overall experience. And, and so if we can all work together to create that experience and, and create something new and create that wow factor and tell that story, um, that's, I think, where, you know, where the greatest benefits are going to be in the future. So for those listening, it's about the experience. Go ahead and get that guide written because it takes a while. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's a lot of work, but the industry would love to have it. Cool. Well, gentlemen, we're going to get to the fun part of this uh, show where we're going to talk about the uh, final five on live. So just some fun questions about uh, your personal environment you've been in. Uh, so, Rick, I'll start with you. Um, you know, traveled a lot in this industry, so in the dental lot in this industry. Um, outside of the industry, who's inspired you uh, the most? I want to give everybody a name and go Google him and, and find out uh, as much as you can about him. Uh, uh, my, the most inspiration I've had outside this industry from a gentleman named Jeff Olson, O-L-S-O-N. Jeff is the author of a New York Times bestselling book called The Slight Edge. And what it is, what The Slight Edge is, is a, it's, a, it's a principle, it's a philosophy of how to live your life about how doing the little things every day that seem to make no difference at all in the act of doing them actually have an incremental uh, influence on whether your life goes up or whether your life goes down. Uh, it involves every aspect of your life, uh, finance, business, relationships, your job, uh, everything that's close to you. And Jeff, has, I've read the slide edge, I don't know how many times, 12, 13, 14 times, uh, just to be able to continue to get the experience and be able to get my philosophy right about how I approach everything else. So uh, Jeff Olson's my guy. Hmm. John, how about you? Uh, you know, I, 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 I've been thinking about this and, and I, I really, uh, to put a, a single name to it, um, I don't know that I can do that. What I admire most is, is folks who, who put 110% effort into, into being the best that they can be at whatever they're doing. And it doesn't even matter what you're doing. Um, and as you go through your career, you'll have different jobs, but you know, whether you're a, whether you're a surgeon or whether you're a waiter is if, you, if you're putting 110% into that job and, and you're proud of that job and you're proud of, of doing the best that you can do with that job, that's what I admire. And that's what I appreciate, um, wherever I find it. And, and I look for it. I look for it all the time, whether it's on the job or, or, you know, just driving around town running errands. I, I always look for somebody who is, who is willing to go that extra 10% and really is enthusiastic about what they're doing and, and, and how they're doing it and, and what kind of an experience they leave you with. Cool. Very cool. John, you've traveled a lot and still are traveling a lot. Um, on the road, what has been your favorite place to eat? Oh, gosh, I don't. I don't really have a favorite place. I'm not that picky when it comes to eating. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, no, I, I, I appreciate a nice, a nice gourmet meal every once in a while, but you know what? I, I, I appreciate just as much sitting down with a, with a bag of chicken wings, um, mm -hmm. sometimes. So I don't, I don't have a particular place picked out that, uh, that I would, that I would say is my favorite. All right, Rick, how about you? 
Well, uh, since my favorite city is New Orleans uh, and has become so over the last mm, 20, 25 years, something like that, uh, I always go back to the counter at Drago's in, uh, in New Orleans down near the river and uh, love getting a, a dozen of charbroiled oysters and that'll do it for me. Mm. Gotcha. So am I hearing New Orleans is your favorite city? It is. It is. I've got, I've got friends. I've got new friends that I've never had before. Uh, I love the neighborhoods. I love the culture there. Uh, I love not being there during Mardi Gras. Uh, <laughs> but uh, but I, have, I have some great clients there. And uh, when I can get there two, three, four times a year, I'm just in heaven. And John, how about you? Favorite city you've traveled for work? You know, I've, I've been really fortunate to have traveled to a lot of different cities um, in a lot of places around the world. And, and some of it was, uh, you know, with the, the time that I spent with the cruise lines and some of it has been um, since then. Um, I had the, the, the really great experience of, of being able to live in Nagasaki, Japan for about three months uh, while one of the ships that I worked on was under construction. Mm -hmm. um, and I, 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 I like Japan. I like this. I like the country. I like the cities. Nagasaki was, was a wonderful city. Um, Dubai, I would say stands out as, as one of the most impressive cities mm -hmm. that I've ever, that I've ever seen. Um, and, and so many of them on the list. And, and, and of course, every once in a while, it's, uh, if you can, if you can find a day to relax on the beach in Aruba, that doesn't suck either. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Rick, favorite movie of all time. Close Encounters. Uh, thought about that one. Uh, probably because the lead character, Roy Neary has such a belief and a vision in what he saw and he relentlessly went after it, sacrificed everything, put it all on the table. And uh, it wasn't until other people came along with him and he was able to prove out his theories um, that, uh, I mean, it could have gone either way. Uh, but th that always stands out uh, as, uh, you know, having belief in what, you, in what you're going for and just go for it with everything that you've got with your entire uh, vision and pursue your dreams. That's why that's the movie for me. Wow, you, you put a whole lot more thought into that question than I did. <laughs> uh, I was going to say Weekend at Bernie's, but I'll just say The Godfather. <laughs> yeah. Great movie too, John. <laughs> you can't go wrong with either one. <laughs> and John, I'll close that with you. If you didn't get in the AV industry, what would you be doing? Oh my gosh, I don't know. I, I, I'd be doing something because I'm, I'm, I tend to be a, a pretty resourceful person, so... I, I don't know. I really don't know what it would be. I'm not exactly sure how I got into this industry, to be honest with you. Um, it was really uh, quite by happenstance that I was doing the freelance work in Orlando and discovered, you know, audiovisual. Um, so I'm really glad that I did because if I, if I weren't doing it, I'm, I'm not sure what I would be doing, but I can't imagine doing anything that I would enjoy more. Rick, how about you? Uh, at uh, that juncture back in San Francisco where I was uh, going to get into the AV industry and right on, right on the heels of, of doing so, um, I was also being enticed towards venue management, uh, towards working in a facility. And the reason for that that, that drew me to it from all of my background was that I loved in, being in and around theater and entertaining people and really seeing smiles on people's faces uh, and seeing satisfaction from a from a visceral sort of uh, uh, perspective. And so, uh, so seeing that happiness and being around that is just kind of infectious. And that's probably what I would have ended up doing somewhere. So either that or making balloon animals, right? Or making <laughs> <fun> balloon animals. <laughs> I actually did work for, with Steve Martin for a time. So that's <laughs> pretty cool. That, that should be a show by itself. It is. <laughs> Let's do it. Cool. Well, gentlemen, uh, where can folks find you on the web? LinkedIn, Twitter? Um, I'm, I'm on LinkedIn. Um, you won't find me on Twitter or Facebook, um, but I do have a profile on LinkedIn. And um, our, our website is uh, www.mvp-av.com or www.psavselect.com. Rick, and how about you? And uh, I'm on Facebook. I, uh, my website is intentionalav.com. Uh, and there's a full site. You can sign up for my list and actually download uh, a copy of the Meeting Planner's Guide if you wish. And if anybody cares to get in touch with me directly, I actually have a link to my 
uh, calendar where you can schedule some time to get together one-on-one -on -one with me at connectwithrickbloom.com. And that goes right to my scheduler and we pick out a time that's convenient for you. We can schedule some time to, uh, to talk together. I'd love it. Fantastic. We'll include those links in the show notes. And so with that, gentlemen, thank you so much. Um, the industry will truly appreciate the work that you've done um, on being, you know, two of the key voices in this guide. Uh, the Meeting Planners 21 Step Guide to Audiovisual Awesomeness. We'll have a link uh, to download that guide in the show notes. But thank you so much again for putting your, uh, your, your mind and, and passion into uh, this document. It's, it's going to be one that will help continue this journey and, and bring it along in a positive fashion. Well, and, I, and I would say, Wallace, and I think I can speak for Rick and I, that it was, it was a lot of fun working on it. Um, we, we, we collaborated back and forth quite a bit, and we went through a number of iterations and a number of rewrites <laughs> and just trying to fine tune it and, and get it to where it needed to be. And then we handed it over to Infocom and they put their magic touch on it and, and came out with such a, a, a beautifully designed um, hard copy book and, and then um, the, the version that's online as well. So it was a, it was a good experience and I enjoyed working with Rick and, and I hope, uh, hope lots and lots of folks find it helpful. Great. Good. And thank you, John. It was great working with you and Wallace. Cool. Fantastic. Well, that's a wrap. Again, you can download the guide and check out the contact details in the show notes. Until then, we'll see you next time on The Lob Life.